Okay. Uh, good, good day to everyone and welcome to the Ossington Circle. I'm Justin Podur, your host. Today I'm here with John Clark from the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. The Ontario Coalition Against Poverty is an organization that fights for the rights of poor people and has done so for decades. Um, John, thank you for coming. Thanks very much. Okay, so John, first of all, uh, I wanted to talk, maybe we should just introduce what the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty is, what it does, the idea of direct action casework, uh, mobilization. Yeah, well, we are a, a poor people's organization, and as you say, we've been going for more than a couple of decades now, uh, based largely in Toronto. Uh, we organize communities that are under attack, that are facing poverty, to, to fight back through, through mobilization and to a significant degree through direct action. Um, and that involves challenging the bigger social cutbacks and broader questions, placing demands before governments, etc. But it also does involve taking the same kind of collective action to defend people in their individual situations when they're denied benefits, when they're facing eviction, deportations, these, these, these kinds of issues. So can you give me an example of a direct action case from recent OCAP history? Um, we recently for example, confronted a situation where um, someone uh, was living in a, a bachelor apartment within a Toronto community housing unit. Um, he, he'd come here as, a, as an immigrant uh, recently. Uh, his family was able to join him uh, belatedly. There was no larger unit available, so the de demand of Toronto Housing was that they, um, that they, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, mother, the mother and the uh, and the child had to leave and had to stay in a homeless shelter. Um, uh, we certainly agreed that staying in a, in a bachelor unit, a, a whole family, was not a viable long-term solution. But uh, as a stopgap measure, it was infinitely better than the family being broken up. Um, uh, Toronto Housing wouldn't cooperate with this, so we brought a mass delegation to their head office, suitably located in Rosedale, <laughs> and, uh, and challenged them. And, uh, and while the immediate response was a line of cops and a refusal to negotiate, the public pressure that was placed on them forced them to, uh, to relent and, and, and deal with the situation. And I, I've always thought of OCAP as an example against the idea that these things are, are hopeless. Actually, OCAP's direct actions have a high success rate, don't they? Yeah, a very high success rate, yeah, precisely because bureaucracies can't withstand disruption. By definition, they need acquiescence. So when you refuse to deliver that, you have some power in your hands. And, and so it's, it's, it's almost an, an answer to the idea that you can... I mean, what would you say to people who say, you know, if you stay quiet and play by the rules and, and, and follow procedures, um, you can get better results than trying to do this disruptive stuff? Well, I, I would say that any serious examination of the historical record or the present reality demonstrates pretty, pretty successfully that as long as poor people are quiet, they can suffer all they want. It's, it's a period when poor people are restive, when they're challenging, when they're mobilizing, when they're fighting back, when they present a problem for those in authority, that, that some level of concessions can be won. Uh, and I, I think you know, the work of OCAP just, just verifies, confirms what we already knew. I, I wanted to talk to you about, I mean, here's OCAP working with poor people, um, fighting back you know, on the ground, and, uh, and then on the, on the surface, as, as someone who's watching the media, we're, I'm watching these scandals take place in city politics and in federal politics, and it seems very disconnected to me. Um, like, this thing that happened with Rob Ford, this crack video, this was in a, a poor community that I think OCAP has some connection to, is that right? That's certainly true, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so... For me, the whole debate that went on about Ford, I mean, it seems like it's kind of coming to an end now. Now, people, now the media has gone back to quoting Ford's outrageous statements on policy or privatization of garbage collection or whatnot right. and stopped asking him these questions about where's the video and is there a video and did you smoke crack? I mean, I'm, I, I'm pro-legalization. I don't think drugs should be illegal yeah. um, and so I don't even I don't even follow that that scandal very very much on the other hand I am 
I, you know, not a fan of Ford because of closing of daycares and libraries and, and attacks on public housing and, and um, privatization of public services. So what do you think of, of that, of the, the idea of, of a scandal that focuses on the personal behavior of a politician versus this kind of actual class war that's going on on the ground? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you that significantly it is a diversion. Um, I think that it, it, it obviously does take attention away from the actual issues that people need to be focused on and people need to be, need to be challenging those in, in, in power over. I mean, it is true that the fact that, that, the, uh, that the person sitting in the mayor's office is, is, uh, is really quite a dysfunctional individual uh, is, is part of the political mix and that has to yeah. be taken into account as well. Uh, I suspect that the, that the scam, I mean, I, I suspect that Ford is more, is more expendable right. than, than is uh, the Harper government, for example. Right. The scandal there is, I think, much more serious because it, it, does actually, it does actually pose the possibility that the regime of choice for the austerity agenda mm. could actually not be viable any longer. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Ford, he's, he's a, a political buffoon that right. they can get rid of quite readily, I think. And hopefully they'll get on with that. <laughs> uh, but the, you mentioned the austerity agenda. I think that's something that's worth kind of going into in some detail. Um, the, the idea of austerity is this idea that we governments can't afford the kinds of social programs that we used to have in the past. It was nice to have universal health care. It was nice to have a welfare state. But unfortunately, we can't afford those things anymore. Um, and and how, what do you think of that argument? How do you answer that argument? Well, I mean, I do think that the austerity agenda, I think you have to differentiate between what, what happened in the period since the late 70s mm -hmm. up to about 2008 and then what has changed after 2008. Okay. I think, I think in, 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 by the 70s, the post-war boom had, had, had run its course. Yeah. Uh, there was a fall in the rate of profit. There was a real crisis within the system. And the solution was to take back uh, the concessions that had, been, that had been advanced during that period of s stabilization after the Second World War. So I, I think those who just see it as a mean-spirited agenda are making a mistake. It, is, it does actually reflect an actual crisis within the system itself. Um, and, and since 2008, it, it, is, it has metamorphosized again based on, uh, based on the crisis that emerged into a kind of a hyper-austerity. Um, so it is, it, is actually, it is actually based on the needs of the system in that sense. It's not just that somebody in a ballroom has made some mean-spirited choices. Right. Um, but of course... It's an entirely selective logic mm -hmm. uh, because it, it operates. Obviously, they can't come out and say we're doing the, this in the interest of a tiny percentage of the population. Right. Um, they have to maintain this fiction that they're doing it in the interests of everyone. Right. So they justify it as we must get the debt under control, we, which, which I find it quite incredible that they can do that after they've so recently poured trillions of dollars into, into right. banks and, and, and failed corporations. But I suppose if you run the means of disseminating information, you can pretty well say what you like. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, it, it is an attempt to impose a, the burden of the crisis on the backs of, on the backs of most people. And it's, it's having the most profound effect internationally. And I, I think that we're only seeing, the, in fact, the opening stages of this agenda. I mean, back when the G20 was meeting, which is only like three years ago, the IMF had recently said that they wanted to see 20 years of austerity. And, and so we're only in the opening stages, and it's becoming more and more and more pronounced. And, and its ramifications are, are many. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was in India for the past four months, and there's this hyper drive for mining, for example, in central India, where they're desperately trying to suck out the maximum amount of iron ore and aluminum yeah. from these territories and displacing these people. Um, how does it play out in, in the wealthier countries? What does it look like here? I think it has two main, uh, two main fronts. One is an attack on social entitlement because there is a level of social infrastructure in the historically privileged countries and they're looking to, to take that away. Uh, and, and at the same time, and, and linked to it, is an attack on trade unions, mm -hmm. on the strength of trade unions and the viability of trade unions. And of course, the two agendas or the two parts of the agenda work to complement each other. 
because to the extent to which you take away things like pensions and income support systems and the social wage generally, you weaken the bargaining power of working people vis-a-vis -vis their employer and facilitate the process of union busting. And you've had an, a kind of an, a position uh, relative to the union movement in, in North America and Canada and Ontario uh, and made a specific argument that's, that's trying to say if you fought more like we fight, you would get better results than you're getting. Is that an accurate summary? Um, yes, I mean, yes, I mean, it's an approximation, but it's right. <laughs> <laughs> Paraphrasing a bit. So how, how, how much success have you had with that argument? How, who's taken it up? Where, what have the replies been? Well, I mean, there is emerging, I think, within the unions, um, an increased readiness to, uh, an increased readiness to fight back. Uh, to some degree, that's decisions being made by union structures themselves, and to a significant degree, it's pressure coming from um, from rank and file activists who are looking to uh, are looking to push forward. But there's no question that the trade unions embody a, a, a real a real crisis mm -hmm. um, because they the whole sort of relationship between unions and the state and the employers was emerged in the post-war years in, in a period of, of compromise and so there was really an unspoken deal whereby incremental improvements would be provided to, to, to workers and their families and the broader working class population in return for um, ensuring that the struggle didn't become too explosive and too generalized. So unions played the dual role of brokering concessions, but at the same time maintaining peace or at least keeping the struggle within certain boundaries. Uh, the difficulty we've had over a long period of time is that the other side has in fact revoked the deal, and unions continue to play by the, by the rules of a dead deal. Right. Now up until 2008, that translated into an incremental process of taking away past gains. But I think in the context of hyper-austerity, continuing with that, that way of doing things is pointing in the direction of catastrophic defeats. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a real crisis within the unions. There is a need to actually break out of the model of so-called labor relations that's been imposed on workers and actually, and actually engage in much more explosive and generalized forms of resistance. And um, what do you, is there any, any signs of that on the horizon? Um, well, I mean, one of the things, of, well, I think one of the things about this period is that there are, there are, there are no, there are, there are seldom yeah. signs in yeah. the sense yeah. that, in the sense that things emerge that are, are totally unexpected. Right. Um, well, I, I, but l let me let me ask you a, a, a different question because I, I also, you know, you mentioned the G20, and I think of this, you know, you you used you just used words like we need more explosive forms of resistance, um, and that leads to an inevitable question, especially for people who are, uh, you know, radicals who believe that the the fundament the system is fundamentally flawed and needs to be replaced. Um, you know, does that translate directly into specific tactics? Like, are there more radical tactics? Are there more, you know, should we encourage, you know, the phrase that, that is popular on the left of a diversity of tactics? Are there tactics that are more appropriate to situations? Like, how do, how do you, how do you think we should approach, um, tactical and strategic questions under these kinds of circumstances? Well, I think, I mean, I think that what we need to do is actually is actually win um, within our movements, and, mm. and then at the same time increase the size of those movements uh, to win people to a perspective that I mean, tactics can be varied and tactics can adapt and, and change, but the fundamental orientation that I think we have to have is that we have to realise that the notion of protest, even the word protest, has its limitations. Yeah. Uh, the notion of that, that we're going to be able to make a moral case to those in power of one form or another, or even a so-called show of strength, where just by virtue of the fact we can get a lot of people together, that that is going to somehow is going to somehow convince those in power that the austerity agenda is a mistake, and that we need to go back to the the golden age of Keynesianism. Uh, that's not a viable solution. We have to, first of all, if we're going to actually actually place limits on what they can do. 
we're going to have to find much more fundamentally disruptive forms of organizing, uh, strikes, uh, forms of mobilization on the streets that actually cause disruption and problems for those, for those in power. And I, I do think as well that that has to be linked to a realization that this is an actual crisis of a system and that social transformation has to be the goal of movements as well. It isn't just that we can be militant enough to make capitalism kind. Right. And that's, that's what I was thinking because, um, like, what role does consciousness play in this? Like, what I'm, what I'm torn between is, you know, trying to explain what protesters are doing, you know, what we're doing to people who aren't necessarily automatically supportive, who are, you know, watching the, the media, right. <laughs> you know, disseminate right. stories of just crazy people in the streets doing crazy things. Right. Um, you know, how much, how, how much, should I should I not worry about that, or you know, ha what is the what is the what is the role of of us in trying to change consciousness or education? Honestly, I think that we're in a period now when when people who have an established radical perspective can find themselves overtaken by people who a few weeks before hadn't even thought about politics mm. you know i mean that's that's good that's potentially good news it is potentially good <laughs> since news. there's I mean, like it's, 12 it's, of us who yeah. have established a radical <laughs> not 12. no no but it's i mean i mean i mean we're having this conversation at a particularly remarkable time and if you think of uh, i mean people have been fighting in greece for a while but i mean yeah. in, in 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 turkey um, in Brazil, yeah. uh, what's now unfolding today and tomorrow in, in Egypt, mm -hmm. I mean, is an indication of the fact that, that, that these are incredibly explosive times. Yeah. And people have come out, if you take the case of Brazil, I mean, people, it was a place that was seen as very much controlled. They, yeah. you know, they, they seem to have the problems under control, uh, relatively, uh, relatively uh, compromising kind of a regime in power. And soccer, with soccer, soccer fans, soccer, soccer fans, <laughs> and, and and it's it's just it's just fallen apart in a way that's incredible. Now that means that there's been people coming onto the streets who had no background, no experience, who never thought that they would be doing this kind of stuff, being incredibly militant and taking these kinds of stands, and and, and being in, showing incredible courage in the face of you know quite brutal police conduct and all the rest of it. The initial stuff that unfolded in in, in cities around uh, around the transportation issue. I mean, people were being fired at with rubber bullets and and subjected to all kinds of brutality and were standing their ground. And that's before it took on a really really mass character. Well, I have a friend in in Brazil in Sao Paulo, and he wrote a report to some of his activist friends in different parts of the world and he um he said that one thing people don't realize is this this outburst or outbreak this uprising <laughs> um, i have having trouble finding the word but this particular mass protest that's been happening was preceded by about a year of uh strikes yes, yes. in which like several close to two million people were on strike including the transportation workers and yes. other sectors and something like 75 percent of those strikes were successful yeah so yeah. there's this whole background of successful mobilization um where people were doing the kinds of things that you know resistance like you were saying yeah and uh so it didn't come out of begging and pe pleading and petitioning and, and things like that and trying to work within the system no it no came from trying to say we have to confront this no absolutely absolutely but but i think at this stage i mean we're seeing i mean the last months have seen some have seen a real leap in terms of, of, of mobilization but the mobilizations uh contain are, are primarily primarily very positive mobilizations but you can also see their weaknesses first of all you can see that you can see uh, you can see people's illusions and people's limitations um, and you can certainly see as well even quite reactionary elements trying to vying for control and leadership within these, these within and countries. outside like in Brazil the organized right wing is yes. starting to mobilize yes. they've had paramilitaries in the countryside for decades the the Greek uh, kind of fascist mobilization yes. so there's a it's a kind of a chaotic situation no it, it is it is which 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 sort of comes back to the point we were we were sort of grappling with is of the the role of the role of consciousness right. like the like 
we're not going to stop as powerful as these things have been. They're, they're pretty well surviving them at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be making some limited tactical concessions, but they're getting control of the situation. They're maintaining, I wouldn't say they're maintaining peace, but they're maintaining order. Uh, they're maintaining some kind of, of order through, uh, through a combination of repression and, uh, and, and, and limited concessions. So there is a real need for like very serious, I don't think didactic and elitist, but, mm -hmm. but political interventions within those movements that actually, actually advance ideas and directions and, and goals and try to actually, to try to actually give this anti-austerity upsurge some, some political form and direction. I think that's needed. Right. And that's hard in, in Brazil because the Workers' Party says, well, just join us if you yeah. have a problem. And here we have a similar kind of situation in the sense, like the NDP would say, why don't you just join us? Or the unions would say, you know, we need people within to push these arguments. So yeah. where do, what do you think? What do you think of that? Well, I mean, we do have, I mean, we do start from a very low level. There isn't I mean, we are we're dealing with. If you take if you take the period, for example, of the Great Depression, the 30s, um, there was a capacity for political intervention that was much greater than than, than exists today. Um, I, I would say that there were profound problems with the Canadian Communist Party by the 1930s, but nonetheless, there was a network of anti-capitalist radicals um, who were actually in a position to go in and uh, and organise. Certainly, with overall policies that 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 were highly problematic, but still, still, I mean, the intervention was real. It actually produced results. Uh, we don't have a corresponding structure today, um, and and it's true that the the the, um, the role of misleadership within the movement is much more refined and developed than it was in in that period, and those are problems. But on the other hand, I, I think probably the, the the crisis is more insoluble. And, and taking place at a higher level than it was in the 1930s. Wow. So I think, I think we have possibilities opening up for us that are incredibly exciting. I, I've, um, I've recently read a piece by a guy named Luke Elliott, an activist in Boston, and he talks about a case in Vermont where they, people started really small and, and, and managed to win some real gains like a Canadian-style healthcare system on a state level. And he said, you know, Electoral, electoral work on the left has to be local. Forget about the presidential election. Forget about these things. Like, think about places where you have a chance and build up from there. And, you know, I, I, we started with um, OCAP. We talked a bit about big picture kinds of things. Um, but let's get back to the local. What's what's next for OCAP? What's kind of on the on the agenda? What should we watch for as friends of OCAP? Or... Right, right. Well, here in the city, um, actually it's been really quite an exciting period for us because the last couple of years has really seen uh, has really seen the base of people that we have really being significantly renewed and our capacity to mobilize I don't think has become larger in the sense that, our, that we're pulling out more people to individual events but what we're actually seeing is um, a capacity to engage in ex extended campaigns that we, couldn't, that we couldn't have done even a couple of years ago so that for example when the, uh, the city announced that they were going to close one particular homeless shelter in the downtown east which is where our main base is uh, the uh, the schoolhouse shelter, um, we were able to respond with a sort of an escalating mobilisation campaign that that actually that actually won. Um, it wasn't just a question of you know uh, we announced that we were going to occupy the, the shelter, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and we were very serious about that. It turned out we didn't have to because because we won the thing. And but there was a vote in city council, was there? There was a there was actually a. There was actually a decision made, yeah, by the uh, by the. Uh, there was a decision made by the uh, by the bureaucracy. Okay. But, uh, so, it wasn't, but, so what was the vote in city council that was forty to one? Oh yes, yes, that was around. Uh, that was actually around shelter capacity. Okay. So, and that was that was a that was the next and, and bigger example of, okay. of what I'm talking about is that we we start 
by the uh, by this this past winter, we start to become aware of the fact that the, that the pressure on the homeless shelter system has become completely different to what it's been for a number of years, absolutely at crisis levels. Um, an official shelter capacity was standing at 96%, which is a, a massive situation of inhuman overcrowding on a scale that's, that's unbelievable. With some categories of, of shelters, uh, uh, women's shelters, co-ed, um, certainly any, any, anywhere that cases for people with disabilities, running at 100%. Uh, and in fact, the 90% figure was very dubious. But but even at 96%, I mean, you can imagine if the Royal York Hotel was at 96% capacity. It's just yeah. not a viable situation. Now, the Ford administration, and Ford personally and his brother, really took the position that 96% is fine. There's no <laughs> there's no problem. That's that's right. just great. We can't have empty beds. It's a as uh, right. the deputy mayor put it, a luxury we can't afford. Right. So. Uh, so this, this is forcing people onto the streets. The Homeless Memorial is now calculating a spike in homeless deaths. Uh, and, and, and the level of overcrowding leads to the kinds of incidents that occurred at Seton House where a man got his head beaten in with a fire extinguisher. I mean, just horrible, horrible situation. So we begin campaigning on it. And, and what we find, again, is that first of all, we have a sort of a, a periphery of allies coming around that we, that we didn't have before that we couldn't really mobilize in the same way but within the homeless population a sustained ongoing campaign capacity so we're able to organize two major actions both being the establishment of, of as we described them homeless shelters one at the outside the mayor's office and one at metro hall that led to about 60 arrests but we still were maintaining that capacity to mobilize and in the face of that the bureaucracy had to recognize that in fact the position they'd be taken all along that there was no problem was just not viable. Uh, an opinion survey actually came out showing that we had massive public support on our side around what we were saying and, and even uh, and even 48 percent of people uh, registering support for occupying the mayor's office. Amazing. You know, so, uh, <laughs> right. and in fact 54 percent of people who made forty thousand dollars a year or less. So, wow. so we had like huge, huge support. If yeah. there had been a plebiscite, Ford would have lost and OCAP would have won. That was the, that was, that was, our, that was <laughs> OCAP for mayor. <laughs> OCAP for mayor. <laughs> so, uh, and so that led to a situation where they've had to actually reduce the official level of shelter capacity to 90%, which is highly, highly significant. Yeah. Now, it's still, there's still a big problem right. because their solution has been to cram more beds into overcrowded shelters. Uh, a new shelter will, in fact, be opening in the autumn. Their real estate people are working out where it's going to be and all this right. kind of stuff, which will be a significant victory. But we're trying to get through the summer now where there's heat alerts, yeah. they're cramming people into yeah. places with no air conditioning, so there's going to be more struggles throughout the summer, that's for sure. So you were, you were, um, you were just talking about the increased capacity to mobilize. Any final thoughts on that? Um, yeah, and we've seen it too at the provincial level um, okay. around last year the government announced the elimination of this vital social benefit for people on social assistance, the community startup and maintenance benefit. And uh, we've fashioned an alliance particularly with QP Ontario and, and a range of local anti-poverty organisations that we work with in different cities. And so we were able to mobilize a really sustained and effective campaign. We also made links with uh, First Nations communities on the north shore of Lake Huron who played a really pivotal role in the, in, in the whole thing. And were able to organize a whole series of actions that culminated in a week of action in uh, December. Uh, mobilizations, some 35 different mobilizations in close to 20 communities including First Nations people and, and allies from the Sudbury Coalition Against Poverty, um, shutting down the Trans-Canada Highway. Um, and it led to a situation where the government had to restore $42 million worth of the, uh, of, of, of the cuts that they were going to impose. So, I mean, we're actually now really beginning to emerge as a force that's not just registering an opposition, but it's actually posing a problem for the implementation of the austerity agenda. And proving that you can be successful in opposing this agenda. You, you certainly can. I mean, I, I, I think it needs to be stressed that, I mean, it's, it's true, 
Turkey, Brazil, yeah. uh, and, and on the much more modest scale that we're doing things, uh, it's true that victories are possible, but it's also true that victories are extremely fragile, right. and that whatever you win is 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 is, is not established. It's a it's a it's a it's a respite along the way, uh, something you, but it's something you can build upon. I mean, I mean, we're never going to build a movement. I, I remember having a, a theory with some uh, discussion with some hopeless sectarian a number of years ago who was arguing that the, the crisis of capitalism meant that victories were completely impossible. Oh, that, okay. That, that therefore, therefore, what had to happen is we had to go through the motions of challenging things we couldn't stop until people finally came to the realization you had to overthrow the system. Which right. I think is a, a preposterous way of, uh, of, of so looking nothing, at nothing, 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 and then <laughs> yeah. sudden overthrow. Them. Yes, yeah. right. it's it's all been useless fighting back. So why don't we? Why don't we? I mean, it's 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 just a ridiculous notion. Right. I mean, in fact, in fact, the in fact that's the whole point. That's that's what it, what a, a movement emerges out of is if you have a system that needs to do these things and can't do these things yeah. because it's being stopped by a movement. That's the basis on which real change can happen. Yeah, and then people say hey, we can do this. This is possible. We can do more. We can exactly let's see what exactly. we can do. But, but. Um, so thank you very much. Thank uh, you so much. Justin. I I I do want to promote a book. Um, we uh, we were talking about things that were possible and things that are unthinkable. And uh, my friend Stan Cox has a book called Any Way You Slice It. Any Way You Slice It is a book about rationing. So he talks about rationing. He says that rationing is something we do in our society based on ability to pay, which is the market. But in fact, if you look at societies in different parts of the world, India, Egypt, um, they ration food, they ration water, this is something that can be done. Um, in World War II, there was co fairly comprehensive rationing of commodities, and the point is rationing can be a more fair way of distributing things, and can be a more equal way of redistributing things, and, and therefore it can be a more publicly acceptable way of redistributing energy, food, water, and necessities that are scarce. So. Cox looks at this in the context of the environmental crisis and he says, what if we were to ration energy, um, what if we were to ration things that we need um, in order to try to prevent climate change calamity from happening, and concludes that this would, this would be a, probably a necessary part of any kind of solution. Um, the point that he's mainly trying to make is the things that are unthinkable should be thinkable, and a lot of these things that are just casually accepted, like, oh, well, we're all going to be underwater, and these islands are going to be unpopulated, depopulated, and, you know, Bangladesh is going to be flooded, and Ethiopia is going to be a desert, are, shouldn't be thinkable. And there, we should, we should be able to conceive of alternatives for the economy um, before we conceive of inevitable catastrophe for most of humanity. So... Any way you slice it, Stan Cox, and uh, that's the Ossington Circle this week. Okay.